There we go. Welcome, everybody. This is the second class of 18 for the winter fly tying Zoom classes put on by the Central Oregon Fly Tires Guild. Our guest instructor tonight is Dutch Bachman. And uh, I'm pretty excited about that for our little club to create something that draws from the top of the food chain at FFI is pretty good. And with Dutch's experience that I, I sent out part of this was his whole part of his story, but his whole resume is just incredible. So uh, Dutch, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to you and go ahead and spotlight you and okay. there you go. And I am going to remove my spotlight. Uh, and there you are. Well, here take I am. it away. Well, Sherry, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know it's probably customary for folks to say something like this up front, but I, I honestly uh, want to say how. To, how, how pleased I am to be here this evening. Uh, I've got enormous respect for Sherry uh, and anything that I can do to, to help her in any way, uh, I'm, I'm going to be there to do it. Um, I also appreciate the opportunity for FFI to get uh, some exposure at the same time. But I think most importantly, it, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with folks that um, I have a passion for fly fishing and in particular fly tying. Uh, I lived in Oregon uh, for almost 10 years. My son and his family still live in McMinnville. And uh, if you can imagine, uh, I've been accused of going to visit my son and his family when the winter steelhead are running. Uh, but uh, I guess there might be some coincidental nature to that. but. In any case, uh, I, this isn't just another opportunity to be with some folks and tie some flies. I'm really glad to be with you folks tonight. We're going to tie a couple flies, and the way I like to do this is to explain exactly what I'm going to do and the techniques and so forth, but not just the techniques, but why. I think it's important for us to understand the why about fly tying. And uh, I encourage questions uh, as soon as they occur to you. Please go ahead and speak up, uh, turn off your mute, and ask whatever question might be on your mind. Um, if you're like me, if, if I wait till the end of a, of a program, I'll probably forget the question. So uh, I like it when there's more dialogue, almost like a discussion going on. But we're going we're gonna to address two flies this evening, and I'm excited about this. So we'll jump right into it. The, the first fly that we're going to address here this evening is a fly called the stone hopper. Uh, and this fly was, um, I'm going to do a switch over here. That's the second fly we're going to tie right there, the Kochibandu. But the first fly we're going to look at tonight is, is this fly right here. And it's 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 called the stone hopper, and the, the 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 thought process that went into this was to develop a pattern that would be attractive to trout and to bass. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to present this fly in Montana, and uh, obviously quite a bit around Texas. And I'm very pleased with the reaction this fly generate. Uh, and I wanted to explain a couple things about it. Uh, I didn't want to develop just a another uh, foam bug. Uh, there's plenty of foam bugs out there, but I wanted to incorporate some things in this fly that I've learned uh, that are, are kind of different uh, or kind of unique in some ways. Uh, for example, one thing I learned from Charlie Craven was uh, his theory on creating a foam bug and uh, flies like the chubby Chernobyl uh, or a fly right there the chubby Chernobyl or a fly like the fat Albert 
Uh, those are very popular foam bugs, very effective and so forth. But one thing Charlie Craven has learned is that uh, dressing a fly with multiple layers of foam doesn't necessarily make it float better. That in some cases and in some circumstances, that fly can actually become a little top heavy. Uh, a, a stacked up foam bug like that in warm water reacts okay, I suppose. But if you're trying to present a fly late in the afternoon on a Montana river with plenty of current and riffle and so forth, you need to be able to see the fly. The fly needs to stay buoyant and it needs to, to, to be attractive to the fish, obviously. So one of the things I learned from Charlie was instead of dressing a foam bug with multiple layers of foam going in a vertical fashion, uh, he believes that the foam bug is more effective with what he refers to as displacement. In other words, uh, the, making the foam a little bit wider and not stacking up the multiple layers. So I'm going to explain this as we go along, uh, but uh, there's a couple other techniques we'll use in, in dressing this fly that uh, are a little bit different than what you might see in, in most cases in, normally. Uh, the fly we're going to, the hook we're going to use tonight is a fire hole stick. I, I, I really like fire hole sticks. Um, they're extremely sharp, um, barbless. Uh, they come in you know, many, many models, many varieties. Uh, but I, I really, really like this these hooks a lot. I've never had one straighten out on me, even with big fish. Uh, so I, I'm very pleased with this particular hook. Um, it's important for us as fly tires to uh, understand some anatomy on the hook itself because it really come, makes a big difference. I've dressed a lot of salmon flies and I've learned these techniques as the importance of creating proportions and so forth on flies, uh, but it, it holds true to actually any pattern that we're tying. So for example, uh, this would be considered a, a, a 3x long hook. Now I've learned that many fly tires realize that when they want to tie a streamer or a big foam bug or something like that, they need to buy a hook or have, use a hook that's a 2x long or 3x long, but they don't necessarily understand what does 2x or 3x mean. Essentially what it means is that every hook manufacturer creates a models of their hooks that would be called standard. And a standard hook would be one that uh, the length of the hook shank is actually uh, twice the length of the hook gate. And so in a case like this fly in the hook right now, uh, this is a 3x long. So if I take a hook, the same hook, and measure from the front to the back, I can see here that it's going to be a little bit longer than two times the width of this gape. So there would be one width, there would be two, so it's a little bit longer. So the 2x, let's just use a 2x as an example, a 2x long would be a hook that is a standard length of hook shank plus two widths, two extra widths of the eye. So in other words, the standard length might be here, but if we add two widths of the eye, now we've got a 2x long. This is a 3x long, so that means that this hook shank length would be standard size plus three widths of the eye. To begin uh, every fly, I, I begin thread uh, precisely at the point where the first element is going to be tied in. So I'm going to begin my thread right here and I'm going to wrap toward the bend. The first element is a tail. I'm going to come back to a, a spot right about here. Now, the anatomy of the hook is important at this point as well, because uh, what I'm looking for here is I, I want to be able to tie the tail in so that the tail will stick straight out from the hook shank. The, the shank stops right about where the thread stops. And as soon as this metal, this hook, begins to bend downward, that's called the start of the bend. If we tie a tail in back here at the start of the bend, the tail is going to be tied in at an angle. It's not going to be going straight out from the back. 
So we have to be careful that we don't begin to tie tails in too far back where we'd actually tie them in at the, in the start of the bend because the, the proportion of the tail would be sloping downward and that's, that's not what we, we want to accomplish here. So the first element we're going to tie in is one piece of uh, crystal flash. Now this crystal flash is about 14 inches long. And what I typically will do is go end to end, tip to tip, and come down here and cut that length, go tip to tip again, cut it again, and I'll do that process three times. So I'm actually going to cut that three times. And what I end up with is a bundle of crystal flash that would look like this. And instead of that being 14 inches long, now it's going to be about two inches long. And so what I'm going to do here is to tie this material in, I'm going to lay my thread in front of the, I'm going to tilt my, a little bit, I'm going to go wrap the tail around the thread, and I want to pinch it there so I can see that the ends are, are pretty much in line. There's not any, too many that are too long or too short. I bring that up to the hook shank and I lay that over the hook, and I'm going to do three or four wraps toward the bend, knowing that I'm, I don't want to go too far because if I do, I'm going to go down into the start of the bend, and that, I don't want to be I don't want to do that. So now that I've got that tied in, I'm going to pull that over, and I can trim it in the front, knowing that now the tips are going to be relatively the same length, and it's going to be a little bit longer than the length of the hook shank. Now one thing we, we fall into a pit pitfall in fly tying is we get in the habit of tying the length of a tail or tying the length of a wing to the length of the hook shank. Uh, I think that's especially a mistake on mayflies and even stoneflies. If you look at the natural insect, go ahead and Google stonefly or mayfly and then take a look at the length of that natural insect tail it's going to be at least one and a half, maybe two times the length of the hook shank. So if our goal is to make or to, to dress flies to imitate the natural insect, uh, the tails can be a little bit longer and it would be just fine. The next step we're going to take here is to move our thread forward. We don't have to do neat edged edge wraps. We're going to go forward to a spot about two eye widths behind the eye. We're going to stop right about in that area there. The next thing we'll do is to prepare strips of foam. Now normally we would take a strip of foam, by the way, uh, I tend to tie this fly uh, with tan foam instead of yellow foam. I used to tie it when we started to design it, I tied it with yellow. And in a conversation with Charlie Craven, he says, you know there are no yellow grasshoppers. Uh, so you need to use a foam color. So I started using foam uh, for the foam, for the, for the tan foam. And typically the foam width would be about the size of the gape of the hook. It would be about like that. But because of this displacement concept of Charlie Craven's, I learned that instead of something that's like this wide, I can tie something that's considerably wider. Technically, it's about one and a half gape widths wide. And what I'll do to, to prepare this is just clip the, the corners on one end. My thread's in place. I'm going to take uh, the, my glue of choice at this particular moment, which is a, right now I'm using a Gorilla Glue. You, you can use uh, Crazy Glue, whatever your preference might be. But I'm just going to put a thin layer of glue a little bead right across the top where my thread is on the on the hook shank. Now I'm going to lay this foam in place. I'm going to catch it with a thread wrap, secure it there, and start doing wraps toward the bend until I get back to about this area. I'm going to lift this foam up to make sure that my last wrap hasn't moved or compressed that tail downward. So that's about as far back as I want to go. I think that's about the right spot. So now I'll take my thread and I'll begin to wrap forward, trying to compress some of those uh, 
bubbles of foam right there. It looks like the Michelin Man. And uh, so I want to get that a little bit smoother. My, I'm going to wrap this with Peacock Curl. So it doesn't have to be exactly uh, smooth, but uh, a little smoother than the Michelin, Michelin Man is a good idea. My next uh, element is going to be Peacock Curl. And you can certainly use Strung Peacock Curl if you prefer. Uh, but in this case, we're going to use uh, a feather. And uh, I, I, because I'm using a little bit bigger hook than I normally would, uh, this is about a 10. I'm going to look for longer uh, peacock barbs up in this area here. So I'm going to take about three of those barbs. And to prepare these to dress, I'm going to line up the, the tips. Get all three tips lined up. And then the little white sections you see on the end of the tips is the part of the rachis or the stem that peels off when you pull those off of there if you don't cut them. So those I cut that off of there. I'm going to tie this in right here. Secure that down and move my thread forward. Now to wrap this, these peacock curls, I'm actually going to cord them. So I have three individual strands right here, but I'm going to twist them in a clockwise fashion. Just like with dubbing, I want to apply uh, or, or bite dubbing onto thread in a clockwise fashion because every, as a right-handed tire, Every wrap I take will, will have a clockwise twist to the thread, or in this case, curl. So if I, if I wrap or cord this in a clockwise fashion, every wrap will help to tighten it itself. And to normally I would tie this, I have the hook point sticking out of the vise, but for dem demonstration purposes, I try to minimize risks and keep that hook point out of the way. Whoops, here we go. Peacock curl can be very, very delicate. So we'll go back and do this again. We'll tie that in right there where we stopped the foam wrap, right about there. Go forward. I'm going to cord the hurl. Now I'm going to wrap the hurl forward. And to do that, I want to go over the, the foam, but I put my thumb right there on top of the hook shank to hold that hurl in place so that now I can move this down to go around the jaws of my hook or my vise and I can, I can continue to do that knowing that that hurl is not going to slip out of place just like that. And then once I get far enough in front of the jaws of the vise, I don't need to Put my thumb on there any longer. So I'll just continue to come around here and get as many wraps as I can from this. And I don't want to cut it too short, so I'm going to catch that. Cut that off of there, and I'm going to need um, I'm going to need to grab a couple more. So I can fill that out properly, put my thread right back to where we ended up, tie in three more strands to the stopping point right there, quickly cord the hurl, and continue to wrap just a few more wraps forward until we get to that designated stopping area, which is going to be right about there tie those strands off. I do that at an angle because I like my thread wraps to be edge to edge. I, I seldom will allow a thread wrap to go over top of the previous thread wrap. Um, I did an apprenticeship with uh, Michael Redensich and he asked me a question uh, during our time together. He said, how many wraps of thread do you need to hold in a piece of material? And uh, I told him I, th I thought he needed one and he said well that's fine but what happens if you tie in material using 
uh, two or three. And I said, well, it, it would be tighter. And he said, not at all. Uh, the one tightening wrap is what you need to hold it in place. Uh, so I, I avoid doing multiple, I, do, I avoid doing wraps over previous wraps. So we'll stop right there at that point. Pull the foam forward, lay it over the eye, pinch it right where my thread is, wrap, a loose wrap around. Tightening wraps are always straight up, straight up, straight up. Now that's tight. Fold this back. And I'm going to come, I'm going to end up doing two body segments here. Uh, and so the first one will be, I want them to be kind of evenly distributed. So there would be one right there. And I move the thread under the, the foam, under the body to get to the second body segment right there. Now I can advance the thread back to the first body segment. I'm going to cut the foam strip off about the length of the tail, right about there. And to complete that, I'm going to come back here and just cut the corners off of the foam. So it kind of goes to a little bit of a point there, or more like that. So now when I look at this profile, I'm, I'm, I feel okay with this because I want that tail to come straight out from the hook shank uh, and right under the length of the foam, uh, just, just like you see it right there. So now the next step I'm going to take is I'm going to advance my thread from uh, the first body segment. I'm going to go under the, the, the foam, wrap forward, and I'm going to do edge to edge wraps to as far forward as I can right up to the eye, right up there. Now the next step is to prepare and mount <clears throat> the wing. Uh, for this fly, I like to use uh, EP fiber, uh, and I like EP fiber mainly. It's kind of wanky to work with uh, because of the strands that come out of it and so forth, but it's 0% absorbency. And for a foam bug, that seems to make a lot of sense to me to uh, uh, have a wing that's going to be 0% absorbency. I think that's a pretty good deal. So this is EP fiber and typically what I'll do is the the length from this joint this joint to the tip of my finger is about two inches. So I, I measure it like this. So I'll lay that in my finger, that joint, bring it forward and I want to cut that off right in front of my finger so I end up with a piece that's going to look like this. It's going to be about two inches long. It's going to be like this. Now this is one technique now we're going to do that's a little bit different. Uh, but it's one that I, I actually do this a lot for tails and for wings. Uh, but I want, what I'm going to attempt to do here is to dress this EP fiber so that the tie-in spot is right where the, the thread is hanging. So I want that to be as that, that far forward. But in order to do that, I'm going to hold this material right here at the butt ends, right above the tie-in spot. I'm going to do a pinch loop to secure that wing in place. So to do that, I just do a lift, do a pinch, do a pinch, go around, Go under the material, but not under the hook. Do a second pinch. Now the second time around, I'll allow the thread to go under the hook. And as it goes under the hook, I'll pull straight up. And that's going to do two things. It compresses that EP fiber in my left hand. And it also begins to lower the material to the hook shank. So now that I get that down onto the hook shank, I can do some additional tightening wraps going back toward the bend. Until I get right up against the foam. So now when I, I can see that you know, if I lift up that EP fiber, I'm going to have a little bit of space for the eye, which is just about the right. I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to do 
I'm going to go back forward. I'm going to wrap one more time around the eye because I want it to be just a little bit closer to the eye. Now go back again. Now when I get back here, I've got the material, the EP fiber in place going out over the eye. But I can come back here and cut, the, just trim off the butt ends. And all I'm doing is I clean up on aisle 13. I just a little bulk because you're going to see next I'm going to fold this EP fiber back over the foam and by eliminating those butt ends I'm, I'm eliminating a little bit of bulk in there. Okay now the next step is I'm going to return the thread to the first body segment right here. Now I'm going to invert the fly so obviously it's upside down. The next step will be to take a pair, a, a piece of rubber leg. Now this is, what I like to use on my flies is something called Perfect Rubber. And that's actually the name of it. Perfect Rubber. The brand name is Perfect. Perfect Rubber. I like this type of leg because it's very strong. And if you are dressing any kind of fly where you have to maneuver the, 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 the rubber legs to any extent, they can easily break off. Uh, perfect rubber legs uh, don't break. And they the other the, probably the best part about them is they float extremely well. So if you're going to put any kind of a leg on a fly, a foam fly like this, that might act like a rudder or an outrigger, a uh, foam uh, perfect legs are very very good for that point. So I took this strip of perfect rubber leg, go halfway or go wrap it around the thread so that the tips are lined up. Hey Doug, real quick, where do you, where do you get the material, the rubber leg? Um, to Jerry Chris. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, I, I still do a lot of business with uh, the the Caddis Angler in Eugene. Oh, okay. My fishing right. shop in Welch's. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the fly shops that seem to do much better with fly tying materials carry rubber, rubber leg. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, just check it out. I'm sure they, they have it. But I'll get okay, the tips you. lined up just like that. Pinch the tips, and I'm going to bring that up with a thread and drop that right in between the foam. Now you'll notice where that's going in there is, I'm turn, turning it, that's going in right between the foam, right at the first body segment. And I'm gonna do a couple securing wraps, just like that. Now that rubber leg is secure, but if I let go of it, it'll separate. So I'm gonna hang on to it, but it's tied in right under on the bottom of the fly, onto the peacock curl, at the first body segment. The next step is to advance my thread forward once again to a spot just short of the eye. I don't want to go all the way to the eye. Now I'm going to lay these rubber legs down, allow them to separate around the eye of the hook, bring my thread up and over for a holding wrap and then a tightening wrap. Hold it, tighten it, hold it, tighten it, hold it, tighten it, and one last one. Now look how those legs display out just perfectly. A precaution here, you don't want to go too close to the eye because they'll take an abnormal split. You know, you can avoid that. So I go about just not quite a whole eye width short of the eye to tie those in that first wrap right there. So now if I bring my fly back up to the to the top like this. Okay, now the next step is to take once again my I'm going to advance my thread to that first body segment once again. And I do two times around the body segment because 
uh, I tend to with the rotary vise. I tend to move my 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 vise as I'm dressing a fly. And if I if I were to go from here with the thread up by the eye, go to the first body segment and just go one time around. If I turn that, my thread can certainly fall out of its place. So I like to go two times around. It's not a holding wrap, so I'm not concerned that it's going on top of the previous wrap. It's not a tightening wrap. It's just a holding in place kind of wrap. So now the next step will be to take once again my glue of choice. And in this case, it's uh, Gorilla Glue. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, for for any applicator, uh, there this is this is my glue. Uh, I also use something called Healthy Hoof. It looks like this, and I use that instead of head cement. Uh, Realize we had a bunch of ranch horses, and I realized that if I would put this healthy hoof on the hoof walls of horses and realize all the nasty stuff they stand in all day long, it certainly would be good to hold my the head of my fly in place. But anything you have with an applicator, uh, the very first thing I'll do is I'll cut out about two thirds of the bristles in that brush. So that's about two, that's only a third of the bristles that were originally on that applicator. And the reason for that is if I use that full brush and I want to put a drop of something someplace, that drop is going to be too big. So by cutting out about two thirds of those bristles, I'm reducing the size of the drop. And I can put a drop in place to be just exactly the size I want. So I did the same thing here with my glue applicator. I'm going to lay this glue right across the front edge of that foam, right in there. Now, here is a major league precaution. Do not, do not let any kind of glue touch your legs, your rubber legs. Uh, it's crazy what happens to them when they get on the glue. Um, so you just want to avoid glue getting on the rubber legs. Six months after their second dose, CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky saying with waning vaccine immunity and the new Omicron variant, boosters are a critical tool. We're facing a variant that has... Um, I hope that's not a question. ...to require <laughs> more immunity to be protected. This move comes 24 hours after Pfizer released early data. Which okay, well, everybody please check your mute to make sure that... Variant. Antibody levels right. dropped 25 times lower, but the booster shot restored high levels of antibodies that could take on the variant. Three million. Okay. Thank you. Right. I see that question in the chat. Yeah, it, uh, it's a hairline product, and uh, if you don't go to a fly shop, you can certainly find it online, that's for sure. So the next step now is, and this is another kind of interesting technique, when I first developed this fly, I would take this wing and I'd pull it tight and then lay it down across the foam. And one thing I started doing just a little bit differently is I'd still I'd flatten this out. Before I turn this EP fiber, I flatten it out here the best I can like this. Then I hold on to the tip just like this. But now when I lower this to the hook shank, I'm going to reduce the, relax the tension so that's see how that spreads out and especially if you look at it from the front if i pull that on tight it goes like that but if i relax it it spreads out so what i'm, I'm going to relax it because i would like for that ep fiber to really cover more of that first section of the body so by laying it like that i'm going to do a holding wrap hold that in place tighten hold tighten and now I've got the head exactly the way I want it to look. Part of the concern I had in, in designing this fly was to develop a fly head that would be a little more hydrodynamic. Uh, used the Rogue Special uh, quite a bit uh, in a lot of different rivers, and I like the bullet head effect of that fly, uh, especially as a stone fly. And uh, so I wanted to incorporate something like that into to this dressing as well. So now to finish off this wing, we'll just lay it down here to about the length of the the length of the foam. And I like to use a pair of Fisker's scissors uh, to cut hair and materials and things like that. It seems to work a whole lot better than 
balling up my scissors. So now I've got the wing in place. Now the last couple steps is I'm going to grab uh, another perfect rubber leg. And once again, I'm going to wrap it around the thread so the tips are just are aligned. Now I'm going to raise my thread and guide that rubber leg right into the side of the foam and do a holding wrap. Now it's important that you get the, the rubber leg right about that spot. Uh, you don't want it to be too much higher. You don't want it to be too much lower. You want it to be right about that spot there. You can straighten them up like that. Sometimes I will actually pull on the back one and shorten up the front one just a little bit. I think that looks okay sometimes. So then I'll take a second perfect leg, go around the thread, line up the tips, run the thread over the first body segment, turn it so I can see it. Some of you may recall when we got started in fly tying many years ago, the old Thompson vices, we, they weren't rotary. And some of you may remember, we used to tie with by holding a, a mirror on the back side of the vise so we could see what was happening on the back side. So this rotary really is nice. We can go around like this and some holding, tightening, holding wraps. So now I think those legs are, that one's just a little bit high. So just guide this down a little bit and that's right in place. Now the last step would be to do a whip finish. And you can do that with your fingers or a tool, whichever you prefer. I'll do a tool just for the simplicity's sake. And, and one thing, uh, let me emphasize this right here. When I'm going to do a whip finish, I'll lay the tool in place. And as I begin to do the whip finish, I get that, that cross section of the vertical, the vertical thread and the angled thread. And right where that intersection is, that's all I want to pay attention to. I'm just going to raise this up, only focusing on that little spot right there. And when I can lay that cross section in place and go around, it comes out just in exactly the right spot. Now when I cut thread anywhere on a whip finish, especially uh, like this, and in particular on a smaller head fly or a fly that might have a hackle, I never go in with scissors and clip. I simply run in there and allow one edge of the scissor to cut the thread. And I don't risk cutting anything that I don't want to cut off. Now, one last step here is I'll, I'll even these up. I'll, this, front legs a little bit long and I wanted to emphasize too um, one thing we learn in fly tying or fly fishing is uh, when we're selecting a fly we do that based on match the hatch size shape and color and as fly tires we're always concerned about creating addressing a fly size shape and color uh, th that's a wonderful way to select a fly but there's actually a whole nother element to that it's called biological perspective, and it, I won't bore you with it, but there was a tremendous study that was conducted, and they discovered in predators, not just fish, but in predators, a predator is attracted to prey based on size, shape, and color. And the thing that causes that predator to attack is movement, or what they call animation. Uh, so I tend to leave the legs on this particular fly kind of long. Uh, and I've had no problem whatsoever with the legs being too long, but especially in, in stronger water, uh, a longer leg like that gets a ton of movement, and that movement is what's going to attract the predator fish. So that would be the completed stone hopper right there. And so, Sherry, before we begin the second one, I'll just stop right there and ask if there's any questions from anybody. Hey Dutch, when you were when you were describing the 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 hook and the length of the shaft, you know, and the two X long and that, how how do we judge now when you have some of these hooks that actually they you know the got the gap is so much larger than the older hooks that we used to use? You know that's exactly right, and as a matter of fact, uh, one thing I've noticed with firehole sticks, I think they're one of the first 
uh, hook manufacturers I've seen where they put a designation on their fly boxes. Uh, you can see right here, this particular, this is a, a 839 size 10, 3X long, 2XG. And what that 2XG means, two uh, gate oh, gap. Okay. wide. Yeah. The other thing you'll find too is that if you go to most manufacturers and you see the models of hooks, if you see one called competition uh, or competitive, but mostly competition, and this one, yeah, this one has it here too. You see right here across the top yeah. it says competition. That means that hook gape is going to be just a little bit wider, a little more gape to it. Okay. And um, I kind of like that. It's not a wide, it's not a wide eye, wide gape hook, but it is wider than normal. Uh, so a 2XG refers to the width of the gape being a little bit wider than normal. But as far as the hook shank is, the length of the hook shank is concerned, uh, for most hook size or styles, uh, that standard 1X, 2X, 3X is going to hold true uh, yeah. pretty much. When we get into specialty hooks, uh, bent back and, and many different types of hooks for bass and so forth. But the traditional type of hook will be, yeah. it, all, it all plays off of, uh, of a standard uh, configuration. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah. sir. Dutch, this is Sherry. I have a question. Okay. Where have you fished this? <laughs> uh, thank you for that question, Sherry. Uh, when we started this, uh, well, I had finished a trip in Montana uh, on the Blackfoot River, and it was late in the afternoon, a pretty strong riffle, and I was having trouble seeing my fly. So when I went home, it was on my mind that I wanted to develop a fly that had a little more visibility to it. So I started tinkering around with this, and this pattern, I've settled on this pattern. It evolved to this point right here. But I tie this down to a 14, and it's unbelievable. We have a lot of uh, uh, warm water uh, lakes and, and ponds and so forth, and we get a lot of sunfish, uh, especially brim. And they just can't stand it. Uh, I, I, my rigging, uh, Sherry, is I'll, I'll tie this as my top fly even as early as March. Oh, wow. And the way I like to do it is I don't like to tie anything off of a hook, uh, whether it be the bend or the eye. Uh, I think a dropper fly, uh, I, I handle my dropper flies differently in that one of my real fundamental basic commitments is that a fly must look and act like a natural and anything we do to a fly to alter that is is wrong is a mistake uh, so i've learned how to use split shot instead of putting weight on flies because i can put 18 inches a piece of split shot 18, 18 inches from a bottom fly that split shot gets the fly down but allow since the fly has no weight on it it can still move and tumble in the bottom current just like a natural insect would so i i'll do this in a smaller size but this fly has has attracted uh, trout in montana and colorado um, largemouth bass smallmouth bass gar um, drum um, all kinds of sunfish uh, anything that we have any quarry that we go after uh, has been attracted to this fly uh, so, so you fished started... it uh, for uh, salt water and fresh water? No, ma'am. I have no, not used this in water. salt water. Is this okay. is strictly freshwater fly. Um, hmm. it, it, it's, it's been very, very effective in that regard. How would you tie off a, do you use a dry dropper on this, Dutch, at all? Yeah, uh, uh, th thank you for that question. That's, uh, I, I, I want to explain that. Um, I mentioned I don't like to put uh, monofilament. The monofilament yeah, is not is not material. Monofilament is a is a it, it just means one strand. So we have nylon monofilament, we have fluorocarbon monofilament. Uh, both of those are monofilament. When I put a, a, a dropper fly, I don't like to tie it onto the bend and I don't like to tie it onto the eye because I believe that encumbers the movement of the fly to some extent. So what I've become partial to is if you imagine a nine foot tapered leader 
that taper will extend from the butt section down toward the tip for six or seven feet. Depends on the manufacturer. Then at okay. that point, the remaining two feet of that leader will be level. It no longer tapers. That's called tippet. Okay. So I will tie a, 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 a tippet ring okay. onto my leader at about the seven foot mark. I, I'm very careful to make sure the tippet ring is not tied on anywhere where the taper begins. You need to, you have to use the tippet ring on the level portion of the leader. Then I have one piece of monofilament, typically nylon, coming off the tippet ring that's nine inches or less. It seems, I've discovered if it gets over nine inches, it'll tangle, but nine inches doesn't. So my top fly will be nine inches of nylon off of the tippet ring. The bottom fly will also come off of that same tippet ring and that'll be fluorocarbon, and that one, that length is based on the depth that I'm fishing. Okay. But I prefer to use a tippet ring configuration instead of uh, doing anything to encumber the free movement of the fly. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love tippet rings. <laughs> and you know, don't don't let anybody tell you that you shouldn't use a tippet ring because they splashed on the water. No, uh, I, I've oh. heard that uh, time and again. And if that's if that were true, we, we wouldn't be able to cast a fly because the fly would weigh more than a tippet ring does. And uh, the other thing you can do is put put some water in the sink, cover your eyes and open a packet of tippet rings and pour all of them into that sink and see if you can hear any of them hit the water. <laughs> I, okay. I know the answer to that because I, I've tried that. So I'm a fan of tippet rings. Okay, anything else before we go on? Okay, this next fly is also one of my favorites. Uh, this fly is called the Cocky Bondi. Uh, and as you saw in the handout, it, it's not spelled like that. It's a Welsh fly. And you can see here's the spelling of it, Cocky Bondi. A lot of people will call it Cocky Bondu, but the Welsh pronunciation is Cocky Bondi. Uh, a lot of interesting things about this fly. It appeared in fly fishing uh, publications as early as about 1613, and it's been in publications ever since. Uh, Mary Orvis May Mabry called it her one of her favorite flies. Uh, it's been around for a very, very long time. But here's some things that I think of interest to this particular fly. It's tied, once again, using some pretty unique techniques. It looks very simple, and it is. Uh, but there's a couple other things about the, the history or the, the, how this fly got its name. Cocky Bondi is, is the name for two reasons. In Wales, there is a, a beetle that is red and black body called the cocky bondi it's an actual beetle so they wanted and it was it, it, they wanted to, to create a fly that would resemble or imitate their favorite beetle so they came up with this cocky bondi so it was named after uh, a, an actual beetle uh, that was called the cocky bondi and in, by interpreting that means red and black well, as it turns out, when they were designing this fly, they discovered the hackle was from a rooster cocky bondi. The, the rooster bond, bond, bondi fowl. And so the, this fly got its name both because it imitates a particular beetle, but also because of the hackle that's used to tie this fly. Now, couple of things to, to understand about uh, this as we uh, get started here. The, the, the cocky bondi uh, is, was originally, uh, the cocky bondi hackle feather here uh, is no longer available. Uh, I haven't seen any in a very, very long time. Uh, very hard to find nowadays. So tires started uh, substituting uh, furnace uh, I've also used silver badger on occasion, but uh, the furnace feather 
is very, very, very similar to the uh, Kaki Bandu feather. Now here's, here's what a furnace feather would look like. And by comparison, uh, the furnace feather is going to be a, 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 a darker ginger or a lighter ginger in color. It's going to have a dark stripe down the middle of it. Uh, and that dark stripe, by the way, is called the list. And it, the Kaki Bandu feather had a black tip, and they called that the margin. So on this particular feather, this is a classic furnace because the list is black. It's the color of ginger, but you'll notice there's no black tips. If this feather had black tips, and instead of ginger was a red color, that would, ex that would match exactly a Kaki Bandi feather. The, the Kaki Bandi feathers come in a lot of different uh, sizes uh, off, of, off the same um, cape, off the same neck. So you can see different sizes here. Uh, and it even is available, you can find some that are actually rather small, rather short, but it still has the same markings, same configuration. So we don't have access to the uh, Kaki Bondi feather anymore, so we, we use furnace. For this fly, we're going to use, I'm going to use a tin, which is pretty large, but it's good for demonstration purposes. And very, very important that your hook shank is straight uh, when you secure it in the, in the jaws. Uh, this is uh, an all-purpose kind of hook. And by that, I mean the, the diameter of the, of the wire uh, is pretty versatile uh, in that it's a, it's a good fly for some uh, dry fly patterns, but it's also a good fly for some um, wet fly, soft tackle type patterns as well. So... One of the first things we're going to do here is we're going to begin with a jam hitch. The first element on this fly will be a tip. And so the tip will be back here, right about above where the barb would be, but being a, right about in that area. So being a barbless hook, I'm going to do a jam hitch up here, right about above, right above where the hook point would be, wrapping back toward the bend until I get to a spot. Now this is what I'm looking for here is the same kind of consideration we had on the first fly. If we want to find out where does that start of the bend begin, what's right about where I started that thread. And the reason for that is the first element on here is going to be round gold tinsel. You can see that right back here. It's called a tip. On a lot of steelhead and salmon flies, uh, they're dressed with a tip, a tag, and then the tail. The tip is either a round or a flat metal tinsel. In front of that would be a floss section, usually pretty short. Then in front of that would be the tail. So the tip is very common and very, very much a part of, of older and traditional flies. So the first thing we'll do then is tie on uh, some round metal tinsel to represent the tip. And to do that, uh, it kind of depends on the size of the hook, but typically the tip will be a small or a fine uh, diameter of round metal tinsel. So this is what we're going to use. But one interesting thing you can do here is whether you're using a, a, a fine or a small like this, or a medium, or even a, in particular, a large, uh, one thing I want to do is actually remove that outer layer of metal tinsel. Because inside of that metal tinsel is thread. And to tie this in back here, I want to tie my thread onto thread instead of tying it onto the metal tinsel because the metal tinsel would cause bumps and lumps. So to do that, I just take the thumb of my right hand and place it, press my thumb down on the pad of my index finger, 
right on this tip and just start raking forward like this. And what happens then is that metal tinsel actually comes off and I'm left with, you can see that's this thread right there. So right where I've stopped my, I'm going to turn my, my vise right there. So I'm going to lay this metal tinsel onto my hook shank. I'm going to catch, I'm going to catch the thread of the metal tinsel and I'm going to secure that going toward the bin so that the first wrap of the metal tinsel will be on bare hook metal but the metal tinsel will be intact. The thread from the metal tinsel begins right there and is now covered up by the tie-in. So now I'll take this round metal tinsel and I'm going to go around the hook shank and I, I like to do a full wrap on the metal of the of the hook. Then I'm going to begin to wrap toward the eye and to do that I'm going to go edge to edge wraps going forward edge to edge And I'm going to do five or six, and that will depend on the size of the hook that you're using. A bigger hook, I can use a bigger tip. Now, I won't do it here uh, because this body is going to be covering up uh, that tie-in spot. But sometimes if you're going to use metal tinsel like this, you saw the technique I used to get it down to the thread and then tie in just the thread where well, you can do the same thing now to tie off the material and by that I mean I could come in here and cut that off right here and after I cut it off then take my thumb and just rake it down from the hook shank and peel that metal tinsel off the tinsel left with just the, the, the thread and secure my wraps onto thread don't need to do that on this fly because the body right where we're wrapping now is going to be uh, material and you won't see any part of that. Okay, I'm going to return the thread to the exact spot where the tinsel stopped. Now this is, this is where it gets kind of interesting on this fly uh, because we're going to do a couple things here that are a little bit uh, unusual. Uh, on, on the next elements we're going to use. We're going to have two things. We're going to have two strands of peacock hurl. No big deal, just two strands of peacock hurl and one strand of ostrich hurl. But we're going to look at this ostrich hurl in a very particular way uh, to make certain that we tie it in the way it's supposed to be tied in with a tech special technique. So to start with, we'll come back here and take these two pieces of peacock curl. And once again, I'll get rid of those little peelings from the rachis. And I'm going to tie this in. Excuse me, I'm going to do the ostrich first. First down, last tied. So here's, here's the ostrich. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get rid of that little piece right there on the, on the butt end. But I'm going to come in here and you, you can see how the, you can see the very dark stem or rachis and the barbs coming off of it. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to peel that off. Those little barbs. I'm getting rid of those. Those are gone. Turn it over. Do the same thing on this side. So now what I have here is an ostrich hurl with peeled off barbs on the rachis so that it's a bare rachis. Now here's what's interesting and fascinating about a peacock or an ostrich hurl. We get a customer, we, we get spoiled really with a lot of feathers that have round stems or a round rachis. 
so that when we tie it in, it doesn't roll around. It just ties in very nicely and compresses very nicely. Ostrich is flat. The stem or the rachis on an ostrich is flat. So I want to tie this in in a very precise way so that the top side of this feather is pointing toward me like this and the rachis is you can see that in the middle the barbs on this ostrich hurl do not go 90 degrees perpendicular to the to the rachis they go at a, at a little bit of an angle so if i turn this over i can see how those barbs are angled down but i can also see how the bottom side it appears the rachis is less prominent to see. So I want to turn it back up. Now in this configuration with the ostrich feather face up like this, I can see the pro how prominent that stem is right there. And then now realizing that it's flat, I'm going to have to tie that in so that I catch that flat portion just like that. And then look and I'll take, take a look at what I have. No, that's upside down. So I have to try this again where I turn this over and put the flat portion on the stem or on the hook shank, tie it on. Now that's that's what I'm looking for. Now I'm going to tie in the two pieces of ostrich or peacock curl right in front of that. Okay, right in front of the ostrich, I'm going to tie in the peacock curl right at that same spot and begin to wrap a little bit forward. And they can be spiral wraps, they don't have to be pretty because this is all going to be covered up with hurl. I'm going to get up here to a spot, uh, once again, about two to three eye widths short of the eye. Now, to dress this, I'm going to take the hurl and I'm going to cord it once again, I, meaning I'm going to twist it. Now, there's one other option you can have here. Uh, because peacock hurl is kind of a fragile material, uh, and if you don't want to cord it, and take the chance of, of it tearing. I can keep my thread back here where I tied it in. And now what I'll do is I'll just wrap the peacock hurl around the thread a couple times in a clockwise direction. Now all I have to do is wrap the thread and the peacock hurl together going forward. Once again it's taking half twists. going forward and one of them came out both of them came out so I'll back up catch them again Where I left off, but to finish this off, I'm going to cord them and then continue the wrap going forward to that designated tie off spot, which is going to be about two to three eye widths behind the eye, right about in that area, edge to edge going toward the eye cut those off. Now here's what's kind of unique about this. I've got the, you can see the peacock curl is wrapped on. Now I'm going to take that ostrich and with the prominent side of the rachis, the top side facing forward, I'm going to begin to wrap this around the hook shank going edge to edge wraps
just like this. So the, the wrap is going over top of the preceding wrap rachis. Now notice how nice and vertical that ostrich hurl is standing away from the hook shank. And that happens because we took the time to tie it in properly so that when we wrap it, we don't have any gaps, there's no spaces, there's nothing going the wrong direction and so forth. Go to the same tie-in spot. We'll finish the wrap right there. Tie off the ostrich hurl, edge to edge going toward the eye. Now you might think that's kind of crazy. Why did you tie that ostrich hurl on top of the peacock hurl? What's, what's amazing about this is when this fly is being fished and it's wet, uh, the, the ostrich hurl stands up very nicely, but you can actually see the green of the peacock hurl uh, underneath that. So I'm just going to do a little cleanup on aisle 13 here and finish that off in the... Now the next step, I'm going to bring my thread all the way up to the eye. And whenever I change color, that I only use white and black thread uh, to dress a fly. The only time I use color is if I'm dressing a coronamid. Uh, something of that nature that needs a colored body that calls for thread, then I'll use colored thread. Uh, occasionally there'll be a steelhead or salmon pattern that requires a red head to finish as this one does, and that's when I'll use the red thread. So to change colors of thread, I'll move the white thread as far forward as I can, and all I'm going to do is a jam hitch and begin to tie this red thread right over top and every wrap I take of the red thread toward the bend is capturing that white thread that's hanging there. I'll come back down and cover that up. Come back to the spot right there. Done. Now the last step is to prepare a furnace feather and for this one, I'm just going to use a feather, this, this, one, this one here. And to prepare them, uh, normally, uh, I think I can turn this. Normally, I keep a hackle plier around the stem of my vise. And normally what I would do is peel the tip off and begin to pull all this down, just like this. I would put this into the hackle plier and while that's in the hackle plier then I take the edge of my scissors and I rake down at a 45 degree angle down the side of the rachis on both sides and that causes those barbs to fold downward. You can also do this in hand where you can hold it like this and actually just grasp it in your fingers, roll it up, and those will, will begin to peel down. So it's folding feathers, and there's, there's a couple different ways to do it, but we won't take the time right here to do that. Uh, just know, typically I would fold those feathers before I tie them in. So I'm going to tie them in right here, two wraps in the front, and I like to put one behind. I learned that from my friend Al Beatty. And I'll secure that hackle, not going all the way to the eye, because I know I'm going to have a stub right there, and I want to be able to have some room to cover that up. Okay. Now, once again, normally this hackle would be folded already, uh, but... Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it and we're going to palmer it forward and you'll see the, the, the cocky bondi sometimes tied so that the, the hackle looks like it's very vertical and that's one style you might prefer like that particular style and that's fine uh, but another style is to uh, begin to wrap the hackle 
And when I when I'm tying on hackle, I always have a bodkin in my hand so that after every wrap I can begin to stroke those barbs backward that might otherwise become trapped under there come straight up because it's not folded I'll fold it in place come around untrap straight over fold edge to edge on the previous bracus I don't want any hackle barbs encumbered on themselves. And maybe one or two more. I think that'll be fine. So then we're going to bring the thread up that last spot, secure it. One more edge to edge toward the eye. One more edge to edge toward the eye. And it snapped. Wouldn't you know it? Right at that spot. Well, we can recover. And I'm not going to take the time to re thread that the red, so we'll use white. You'll get the picture. Okay, we're going to go ahead and rewrap the hackle, bending it back, bending it back. And we'll secure it there. And one in the front. And do a little clean up here. Build that head right there. And normally, um, you can use whatever kind of head cement or UV resin, whatever you prefer. And this, by the way, is a hackle plier that I got from my friend Mike Burnham, Southern Oregon. And uh, he made phenomenal tools. I'll put that in place simply because I broke the thread again. And that will hold that thread in place. But what I'll do now is take my head cement and I'll tilt that up toward me put some head cement right on the thread just like that and using the hackle plier wrap toward the material now what I'll do because of this position I'll let that dry I would let that dry then I would put a uh, UV resin drop on top of that um, but for time's sake we'll leave it right at that spot let that dry that uh, head cement dry then I put a resin on on top of it okay any questions on the koki bondi well more about where you fish it um and how to fish it <laughs> this sherry this is one of my favorite uh soft tackle flies and uh, i would use this um uh, I, i'm kind of partial to soft tackles i, I use those a lot and um, uh, it, typically it would be a bottom fly. 
Uh, this time of year in particular, it would be a bottom fly. I could drop it. One of the nice things about tippet rings, not tie, you can really you can really rig, so you can suspend a fly at a particular depth in the water column, and uh, this would be a good fly uh, in any circumstance anywhere within the water column. But typically, this kind of year, I'd put this on the bottom. Uh, normally, during the year, I would use this as a top fly, and the bottom fly would be an RS2. I'm really particular about an RS2. They're just dynamite. Uh, but it's a very versatile pattern, and uh, it's a classic soft tackle. And uh, sorry my thread broke, but uh, there you have it. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, uh, Dutch, this is Al. I yeah. Know when you tied the peacock on, it looked from my vantage point like you tied the peacock on by the tip. Is that correct? No, I tied it on by the butt, Al. Um, I... I where the peeling is on the butt end from the rachis, I cut it there, and I prefer to use the butt end because the rachis there is just a little bit stronger than the tip. And uh, on this particular fly, I prefer to, to use it on the butt end, especially with the ostrich curl covering it up. It's going to be pretty secure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Well, I'd like to take a minute here and uh, thank Dutch for <laughs> being our presenter tonight. <laughs> and um, I'd like to give you just a little bit of time to uh, promote uh, the uh, Learning Center. Ooh. Because I am so, so pleased with how far uh, the FFI has come from when you started that and wanted to make it consistent, clear, and have a look and feel the same throughout the Learning Center. It's so intuitive for you to get your team to design it that way and manage that whole program. So tell us a little bit more about the Learning Center. Sherry, I could I could go the rest as you know. I, I could know. Go hours talking about. That's why this, I said tell I, us a little. I appreciate I appreciate you asking that question, and actually, it's kind of interesting that uh, the answer to that is so specific to your proximity. Uh, when FFI or FFF began just down the road in Eugene, uh, the founders decided this is an organization. It'll be a federation of clubs around the country. And we're going to focus on conservation, casting, excuse me, education, community, and uh, tying resources. Long and short of it all was that the organization developed a world-class casting program and was very, very much involved in conservation efforts around the country. Right now we're involved in over 52 conservation projects in the world. Uh, and that was coming along just fine, but about 2015, the FFI board created a new strategic plan. And I should add that Jack Gillis, who's on the call here tonight, is currently uh, developing a new strategic plan for FFI. But at that time in 2015, it was the first time that this organization actually said, well, let's do something about education. Let's create an educational resource uh, for the fly fishing community. And we started with a clean slate, uh, and when there were a few publications that had occurred over the years, but we decided to, do, to identify the type of curriculum that we thought was important to be in the Learning Center, and we decided up front that it would have to be of the highest editorial and quality assurance uh, procedure that we could, we could actually ha utilize because we had to make sure that anything we put in the Learning Center was going to be uh, timely, accurate, uh, fit the needs and interests of the fly fishing community and so forth. So in any case, uh, the first elements that we relaunched was 2018. Uh, it was the casting instruction. And I don't think it's been announced yet, Sherry, but uh, we have just finished eight brand new casting videos that are now being uh, finalized and will be uploaded uploaded into the Learning Center 
uh, in the casting instruction area. Um, so we started with casting and since that time we've added fly tying. We have a fly tying uh, library. Uh, it's, it's managed by Fred Dupre. We right now have over 2,000 fly tying videos in the Learning Center and it's, it's the most unique database in the world. And it's not an overstatement because you can go to that library, that uh, video library, and on the home page, you can sort. You can say, I'm looking for fresh water, uh, salt water. You know, I'm looking for a particular uh, category of uh, mayfly, caddisfly, whatever. Hit the go button, and that 2000 inventory reduces down to a list of all the flies that meet the sort that you created. And then from that is, a, is if you look at that, then it'll be the video of every one of those uh, flies that you, you ask for. So uh, the fly tying portion of the Learning Center is, is uh, jumping by leaps and bounds. Uh, and also, it hasn't been announced either, but one of my projects that we're just trying to get off the ground right now is uh, to create a Buzz Busick Memorial Fly Tying Library would be a tribute to Buzz, but it would be a tribute to all of the Busick Award winners. Yeah, I heard to, about to, that. Yeah. To showcase all of their uh, educational materials. And Wayne Llewellyn has been incredible in uh, supporting this. But we haven't formally launched it yet, but it's going to be outstanding. So in any case, conservation has uh, continued to, to grow. But the thing that was lacking was fly fishing skills. And so we scoured the country and looked at uh, places where fly fishing skills have been taught. We analyzed uh, those kinds of programs and started to create a curriculum in the learning center specific for fly fishing skills. Uh, the good news is that we continue to grow. And like I said at the outset, we're gonna have 67 workshop recordings that will be uploaded to the learning center on a myriad, it's a full array of topics in fly fishing, tying, conservation, and casting. So it continues to grow. It was a, it's a, it's a wonder project. The education committee, which you've been a big part of for all this time, Sherry has been instrumental in uh, getting all of this moving forward. And we feel very good about where we are. We have six countries that have, that we, somehow they can record the metrics on who accesses the learning center. And we've had thousands and thousands of, of uh, people go to the learning center, but from six different countries, uh, they're accessing the material in there. So that's it, it's more motivation for us to continue to grow the curriculum and make certain that we are diligent for the uh, quality assurance and the editorial content. Well, that I appreciate you doing that because this little club that I started in 2009 has been going along and getting our deal together and uh we're really happy to help other tires promote and go to that website i mean when you say well you don't know how to do something well go to the ffi website and <laughs> it's probably there and it grows all the time so uh please uh be sure and renew your membership and let's keep everybody supported uh, doing this kind of activity. So Absolutely. I wanted to uh, tell you about, and thank you very much for being here, tell you about our next presenter would be uh, uh, next uh, Thursday on the 16th. And we have uh, Sarah Jo Royalty is going to be our presenter. And she's going to teach spay, uh, spay flies and winter steelhead. And by then, she will also be our new vice president of the Oregon Council. Excellent. So we'll get your uh, give you some time to see her, see a little bit about what she's about, and she'll be uh, one of our leadership, uh, new leadership people for our board. So you guys be sure and join us then, please. And I'll send out. I'll be putting this video on YouTube as soon as I can get it set up <laughs> so uh if you guys don't have any other questions uh have a nice evening and we'll see you next thursday thank you, thank you sherry. sherry thanks, thanks you. everybody Good night. For, thank thanks you for being thank here. you Doug. good to thanks, see sherry. you bye thanks, Dutch. see you jack hey brett nice hey. talking to you, you sherry
Bye.